Hello, and welcome to the Persevere Podcast. I'm your host, Patty Post, and today my guest is Aaron Newkirk. Aaron Newkirk is the VP of Global Brand Strategy for Caribou Coffee. I know her as friend. I am lucky enough to have worked with Aaron for a couple of years, and she really is a gem in industry and her breadth of knowledge and understanding of people and understanding of how to define your product market fit and understand your why is beyond what anyone else can offer. I met Erin by sitting at a conference and being incredibly engaged in the panel that she was on. After her session ended, We were in the convention center in Minneapolis and she was quite a ways ahead of me. And I literally ran her down because I had to meet her and she was working for a local company, but her background was healthcare. She had exited her startup uh, and she was on to her next thing and alluded to this coaching that she was doing. This Aaron is my second guest that I have met at a conference and I really want to encourage all of you that if you hear someone, whether it's on a Zoom conference or in person, I always recommend if you get a feeling that that person and you would gel, then you need to go talk to them because 100% of the time that I've done it, that I've chased that person down or I've sent them a handwritten note, I have gotten so much value from it. And I really like to think that the other person has gotten value from it as well. Today, I'm sharing with you just an open conversation that Aaron and I have about brands and how brands engage and knowing who your customers are, that that product market fit, and really as being in business, being an intentional leader and knowing the why behind what you're doing. And Aaron is one of the most gracious leaders and intentional leaders out there. We talk a bit about Brene Brown. We talk about her favorite books and what she's doing now at Caribou as well. So it's a fascinating conversation and I hope you enjoy it with Aaron Newkirk. Welcome to the Persevere Podcast, powered by Checkable Medical and hosted by Patty Post, a female founder, entrepreneur, wife, and mother of three, doing all of the things. The strength to persevere in business is powered by passion, grit, and hard work. The Persevere Podcast is for entrepreneurs and business leaders who set out to innovate and change the world with their ideas. Whether it's fundraising your startup, product development, marketing, branding, or scaling your existing business, this podcast is for you. We'll discuss everything it takes to persevere and build the business you've always dreamed of. Let's make it happen. Aaron, you were my coach at one time, and that was really transformational nine months for me. And you are a beautiful person in my life. So thank you for joining. Thank you. That's wonderful. We'll write back at you, Patty. Thank you. Yes. So let me just brag about you for a minute and you are going to blush, but they can't see you. But let's talk about you so our listeners know who you are. On Erin's website, you can actually go to erinnewkirk.com and learn more about her, but her core value and what she does is build profitable businesses that make the world a better place. And Erin is not only a leader at Caribou right now, but she's an entrepreneur. She has an MBA. She has worked at startups and exited her startup, Red Stamp which was a platform with a mission to make relationships stronger. One tweet postcard at a time. And listen to this. She had over 2 million users and 10 million cards sent. And it was best known for the award-winning app. And she was acquired in 2013 by Taylor Corp, which is one of the largest 
privately held companies in the U.S., Minnesota-based. And she served as CEO until 2016. Then she went to Bright Health. And that was an entrepreneurial venture in and of itself. And it was a billion-dollar startup. And she had the role of chief marketing officer. And she collaborated with health insurance veterans to craft a people-first mission, vision, and values within the health insurance landscape to drive year-on-year top recruitment of any health plan in the marketplace. Currently, Erin is creating day-making experiences at Caribou Coffee, and she was recently named Vice President, Head of Global Brand Strategy. And her team is responsible for setting the tone on how Caribou's brand comes to life while keeping team, guests, and global responsibility as central guideposts. She also serves as an advisor to yours truly, Checkable Medical, and other startups in Minnesota. Consumer work includes award-winning brand management at General Mills and Kaplan, but you have your MBA from the Kelly School of Business, which I want my son to go to, and you have a BA in journalism from Drake and earned a French, a certificate in French studies from Paris. So we both have a journalism background, which do you realize how many entrepreneurs have a journalism or communications background? It's a lot. I actually have this ongoing dialogue with Allison Kaplan, who is the editor of Twin Cities Business, because she also has a podcast, by all means is the podcast. And um, I feel like every time I listen to it and there is someone of interest on the podcast, they have a journalism major. It's a thing. It is. I think it's because we're so curious. We're just innately curious. And bold and risk takers. And I think that is the commonality that we all share. And I think we're pretty cool. Yes, of course. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So let's start out with some rapid fire questions. Since you are the vice president and head of global brand strategy at Caribou Coffee, what is your favorite drink at Caribou? Well, thank you for asking, Patty. And thank you for the nice bio, by the way. That's super Super nice, super kind. So my favorite drink at Caribou is a crafted press, hot crafted press. Usually, sometimes I'll go cold. And let me tell you something about the crafted press because it's unique to Caribou. And I personally think it's one of our sleeper favorites. It's like a lighter latte. So if you like lattes, you'll love the crafted press and you can get it with different types of milks, et cetera. You can get it with different flavor ads. So mine's my favorite is the malted. Ooh, crafted press. It's so good. It's like this light malted chocolate, but you could also get, you know, pumpkin or whatever the flavor is uh, of the season. It's just really delightful. It's light, Um, delicious. I think I'm going to get one of those on my way (laughs) to soccer game tomorrow morning. And I will post about it and tweet about it because I love a PSL on a all Saturday morning. Well, okay. So try a hot pumpkin crafted press. Okay. Hot pumpkin crafted. Press. And then you could get it with any kind of milk you want, like plant-based, the straight up stuff, whatever. Yum. I love it with a good almond milk. Oh yeah. It's really good with almond milk. And then if you, you can get a little extra espresso shot in there, just oh. tell them to, tell them to moose it. That's what we say at Caribou. Oh, oh, oh moose <laughs> it. It's not a bump. It's a moose. Okay. What is your favorite restaurant? Because you're located in Minneapolis, St. Paul Metro, favorite restaurant? There are so many great restaurants in the city. We are very spoiled, as you know, Patty, from your time here. Mm -hmm. My current fave right now is Suki and Mimi. Oh. Ann Kim's latest venture. So I just admire Ann Kim as a chef and an artist. She's a James Beard Award winner and She's just really a lovely human. And she is very passionate about the work she does and the life she leads, very deliberate. She actually practices intentional leadership too, Patty. And she recently just announced she was going to take some time off to regroup and restore. And really? she's awesome. So she's also the head chef and owner of a couple of different places. Hello Pizza, Pizzeria Lola, uh, Young Joni. Oh, so great. I always call it Young Johnny and I love Young Johnny. <laughs> I love, she always has the Polaroid, like that's a signature. Yes. I like that theme. And I, Pizzeria Lola, oh my gosh, that Korean pizza, come on. My favorite. That's my my favorite. favorite. We got to go there again. You were just saying intentional leadership and 
my lead developer actually just came back to Checkable Medical. He took some serious time off. He went to Costa Rica for a couple of months with his family. And then in the summer when his wife was working full time and he decided to stay home with his two girls and taught them a lot of coding and then went on a mountain bike trip and did something. He's like, I just needed, he was literally working like 12 to 18 hours a day during COVID because thankfully for checkable, he did because we developed super fast with his team, but he needed to take that time to step back and be like, okay, I need to do what's best for me and my family. And I really respect that. Uh, So that said, your favorite business book. I love the book Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. I don't think it's super original, but it's not original for a reason. Because one of the things uh, that I love about her work is that it is so Mm heart-centered in the sense that it has to be right at your core. You have to be congruent in how you feel of what you do and then how you show up in the world. And so I feel like Dare to Lead really takes the time to step through and say, okay, what are your core beliefs? And don't, you can't list 10. You have to really think and pare down to three, two or three. (laughs) I might've taken her two and made it into three, but so don't quote me on that, Patty. But the idea of of having these values that are so important and how you show up and, and what you look for in work, and then how can you exemplify that through leadership, really thinking about what's important, stripping out what's not. Mm -hmm. It's an Mm -hmm. awesome read. You'd said your other favorite book was Radical Candor. Yes. Yes. I love that, that book as well. I think the focus on this idea of caring deeply and communicating clearly Mm -hmm. is really important. And it it is a theme in Dare to Lead too, in the sense that clear is kind. It's the sense of, let's just put it out there. Let's have honest conversations. You know, don't be a jerk about it. Obviously it's not an excuse to not treat someone with respect, but that really at the end of the day, what people, what feels good is when you can be clear. And that really is the hallmark of kindness. Mm-hmm. I think both of those books do a really good job. I think in, in different ways, talking about that heart center to the work that we do. Mm-hmm. And not being a different person, right? how I internalize that is I'm not a different person to you versus my investors versus someone I see at the grocery store versus my family versus my employees. I'm consistently that same person. And that's how I I want to show up as myself. And I think in different times of life, I have tried to be something that I'm not or try to be the person that that audience wants me to be. And it was very exhausting. Yeah, it is exhausting. I mean, obviously we both have experiences as white women, Mm -hmm. which is different than, you know, someone who like, we can have uncomfortable conversations. They're usually safe conversations. Like I I can't speak on behalf of people of color who feel unsafe and, and how they show up. But Mm -hmm. I think it is our duty really to show up and, and represent ourselves the way that we are and have those uncomfortable conversations. And when we can be as inclusive as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Slogan in life you live by. Oh, gosh. Well, in the workplace, I mean, in, in, in everything, I guess, I, I really like to do good things with good people. So you were talking, Patty, you know, on my website, I talk about building profitable businesses that have an element of philanthropy or something good to them, you know, inherently good in what they do. And I would say extending that to life, it's the same. It's just you know, I'm not building profitable businesses when I'm at my home. So I, how I've taken that and, and changed that is doing good things with good people. It's what fills me up. Doing good things with good people. That's awesome. It's pretty simple. And I would say that, you know, the thing, the thing about good, right, to me, and the reason it's not great and great is because there's an element of good that I think is not so much about the ego, more about the collectiveness and the impact that we're trying to make in the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just one caring thing at a time, right? Or one exactly coming from intentional uh, place of intention at a time. Exactly. Good hearted. Yeah, for sure. I want to talk about when you founded Red Stamp, something that's really interesting about being an entrepreneur is you found something, you found a gap and you 
are a risk taker, you think bigger, you want to make a change in the world. What was the gap that you identified to bring Red Stamp to life? Yes, that's a great question. So I am a big believer that people start companies to solve problems, real problems. So it starts very much with the human that you're drawn to, either a problem for yourself, a problem for an, you know someone else that you feel like you have an affinity with and you understand or know or can get to know through the process. But the idea of solving a want or a need, a, a dream or a job to do is, is at core to startups. And I know that's what Checkable Medical is doing. So I feel like I'm singing to the choir here. But for Red Stamp, that need became our mission, which allowed us to show up in different ways over the years as technology changed, correspondence changed, behaviors changed. So I talk a lot about the fact that, you know, there's identifying a true need and want that can translate in different iterations because things change, right? I think if anything, COVID taught the whole world that. I don't really need to go on and on about that, but there's not very much that we can control. So having something that is true in a majority of situations that can be adapted to be relevant, I think is really important. So at Red Stamp, at the beginning, it was about helping people remember key dates, not only remember them, but celebrate them in a way that they felt really proud about. So for us, that was thinking, wishing, inviting, and announcing. So someone's birthday, wishing, you know, happy birthday or, or, or sending a thank you note. Like we felt that if we could make it easier for people who are busy, traveling, forgetful, et cetera, to be able to send a note through, you know, their computer, because this is how long ago it was, Patty, it was before mm-hmm. smartphones, um, you know, <laughs> let's do it. And it was before social media too, right? So back in the day, that's, that's where it came about. Our solution at the time was web-based, calendar remembering. You could type it, you'd buy a card and have it sent to you with your dates, or we would go ahead and send it for you in time for the event. And that's how it started back in 2005. Mm -hmm. With the invention of social media, all of a sudden people started having to remember more dates, more people. We also wanted to make sure we, we morphed the delivery so that it was inclusive of the different ways that people were communicating. What held it through from the very beginning of going online, you know, the World Wide Web, typing in your dates, having cards sent to you that you picked out, you know, birthday cards, thank you notes, et cetera, stationary, real stationary, to when we sold the company where it was all about um, being on mobile, you could still have an output of a card, Mm -hmm. but you could just as easily send a tweet or, you know, send a text and have it elevated correspondence. The thing that kept us relevant through, you know, those almost 10 years was the fact that we were always really true to our mission statement, which was all about making relationships stronger. Mm -hmm. And so as long as we centered ourselves on that, our mission statement, our purpose, it could show up in lots of different ways because it was all about making relationships stronger and giving moms, chief household officers, as we Mm -hmm. called them, working or not working outside of the home, whatever that looked like for them, but it was mostly moms the ability to to do it in a way that felt good and looked good. Mm -hmm. That was a mouthful. (laughs) How did you identify women would be your primary users? Did you ever have a hard time with men being like, hey, we like to send cards too? Yes. Well, it's interesting you say that. It started, truly, it started because my business partner and me at the time we were working on a need that we had in our own lives. Mm, You know, mm -hmm. my business partner had just had her third child. She was working full time. Her husband uh, stayed home. She still felt like the correspondence fell on her. In my case, both my husband and I were working. I was pregnant with my son and I was caretaking for my father who was very ill and had a job where I was, you know, having to fly different places and do different things. And I just was never like at my desk when I remembered, oh my gosh, it's my nephew's birthday, you know? So really we actually created the solution for us first. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say that. That being said, as we grew and changed and morphed and realized that we could serve more relationships, we got to know other personas, you know, other people that we could help. And so it wound up, you know, we had, we even named them. We had five different key audiences that, Mm -hmm. that, we felt like we had a solution for, but having that one brand champion really kept us always thinking about who is that person? What need are we solving and how do we solve it? Well, 
I need to do that. The persona work. Yeah. We're doing it in two weeks. Actually, we did it when we started. And, uh, now that we have, and that was when we were just thinking of one product. And now as we think of a product roadmap, how has that changed or has it not changed? And just going back to that. And as we've grown the company, it just, you know, as you have more employees, I think that's such a important piece for an employee to know that's a startup. Are those personas, are the mission, vision, values, purpose, and you do such a great job of articulating that. Well, it's a passion of mine. And I I feel like that is what having that big brand management experience at General Mills taught me mm-hmm. was when it comes down to it, you know, we're all humans working for other humans in whatever way, shape, form, right? And so we need to make sure that the work that we do means something to someone and that's how you make it successful. I just listened to the uh, McKenzie podcast and it was the CPG podcast. And uh, you might know the woman that was on it. She's the McKinsey woman that works in Minneapolis, Carrie. I don't even know her last name, but she's good. And there's two others. And they were saying that brands that allow their consumers to really know their why and their story and who they are, are the brands that are winning. And it turns out that it now is a time for good, you know, startup companies like Checkable to, they would buy from us because they like why we started it. Yeah. Are you finding that at Caribou, that sharing the story of what Caribou is, who you are, makes a difference? For sure. A hundred percent. The research that I think is fascinating is that people are really disenchanted and, and feeling down about the world around them, right? Whether it's political, whatever, all sides, you know, whether it's the virus, um, there's just a lot of heaviness, right? There's mm-hmm. the isolation, et cetera. And so more than ever, doing something that feels good to them is really important. And 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 part of that is deciding where they're going to spend their dollars. I mean, in, in a way, it's, it's their way of controlling what they're contributing to mm-hmm. in a very direct, tangible way. And, and so I've always thought that what you do inside a company is really what you should say outside of the company. So, you know, but now more than ever, I think people are listening and people care. Mm-hmm. I think it goes for everything. It's even like when you choose, you're probably going through this with Will. So you have a son, Will, and I have a son, Will. Yes, our Will. They both are seniors right now. So when we were working together, they both were getting their driver's license at the same time. (laughs) I love that we were sharing that experience, like sitting in the passenger seat. And, (laughs) but the universe, the search for the university and what type of culture do you want to be a part of? And what is this university known for? It's the same right now of how people are spending their dollars of, do I want to be associated with this company? I was asking Lily on the drive home from soccer last night, what brands she likes. Mm -hmm. And so she said, oh, I like um, Athleta. I like that they have mom stuff and girl stuff. And she said, I like that they have mannequins that are all shapes and sizes. Amazing. Like you're 11. That is so cool that you, that you realize that. And I said, why do you say that? And she said, well, because we do. Everyone is, looks different, mom. Like we're all unique and like, yeah, you, you go girl. That's good that you embrace that and that you recognize it, that we're all different and you are accepting of our differences. A hundred percent. And you know, it's interesting because I'm sure Lily, well, maybe because she's your daughter. So I shouldn't say that, but most 11 year olds would not be aware of the fact that they're the certified B Corp, right? Yeah. So they have to walk their talk. It's a requirement, right? And I just love that Lily feels that way. Of course she does. She has a big heart, just like her mom, but it's pretty amazing when you think about that. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh. So like, so Tom's is a B Corp, Bombas. What else? There's like a, is there a coffee company that's a B Corp too? I think there are, there are smaller ones, not on, not on the national or international scale yet. Huh. That's, I would love to be a B Corp someday. It's part of my, when I started, I wanted to, it's Africa gets strep and you end up dying 
or else they find that women are dying on the delivery table at age 18 to 20. And they like, well, why, why does she have a heart failure? It's because she had strep that was undiagnosed and had a heart condition from it years ago. Wow. Wow. So in looking at the world health organization data, there are over 60,000 people a year internationally that die of infectious disease that can be cured with a $1 antibiotic. It's amazing. I know, right? Actually, it's really humbling. Thank you for sharing that. That's important. Isn't that? Yeah. And I am driven to change the healthcare system and take visits from the clinic into the home and make an impact on the burden of the healthcare system by bringing them home. And then also, you know, increase access and affordability and even time management for families. But looking at it globally, it is extremely humbling because they don't have what what we have. So if we can help do that, that's great. Okay. Let's switch gears quick. Erin, when we worked together with coaching, I was starting to raise my seed round. Yes. And not my seed round, I'm sorry, my friends and family round. And that's why I say you were so impactful on me for nine months. You know, having that, I called it a professional business therapist. We just synced so well. But you, you had me think intentionally about my actions And like what I was carrying and I lacked confidence in areas. Would you share with us who you worked with, with Satya and then the work that you had us do? Because I think it, it was really foundational for me and it, someone is listening that wants to be a founder or is a founder. You have really beautiful way of sharing why this is really crucial. Well, thank you. I also Mm -hmm. love working with you. I would be (laughs) remiss not to say. Because I'm such a believer in the fact that our best work is done when our whole self comes to the table, I started a startup, Patty, as you said, Satya, which means um, benevolent truth in Sanskrit. So like an ancient Asian language that I think is really beautiful. And it really describes sort of the why and the how behind the what we do. And so the idea of, you know, living in your truth, especially as a founder is so important because there's so many different people and so many different pressures to react, react again, pivot, you know, hustle. I mean, all of these words that are used for entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship that just really aren't sustainable, aren't healthy. And they honestly aren't, I think (laughs) they aren't the best way to bring forward your idea. There is a reason that you had the idea and the insights, you know, that you did and you do. And the best way to channel those and bring those out is to have a true sense of yourself, your home, however you define your home, your work, your family, all the pillars that are really important to you. And so I think what you're talking about is sitting down with an exercise of identifying what your best day is. Mm -hmm. Not your best day on vacation. You know, Seth Godin, the wise man, the wise marketing man that he is, um, has a quote that I love that's all about, instead of wondering when your next vacation is, set up a life that you don't want to escape from. Mm. And I think that's actually why people want to start businesses and companies, because they feel that they would finally have an opportunity to do that. And that, you know, in corporate workplaces, there's less control. So that's the work we did together is to really identify how do you want to spend your days? And it was a whole visioning exercise, everything from that all the way through to what does that mean then as far as prioritization in your home and in your work and for yourself? Mm -hmm. And with that, I don't know what it was that you pulled out of me, but the confidence to be me and the confidence to I had a lack of confidence in that I had never raised money before. I only pitched to men. And what is it that men want to hear? And I have kids. Should I have not talked about those kids? And I vividly remember pitching to you several times and you would give me feedback. And I, but like, that's how I do it now. You like broke through this barrier for me because I was. I was scared to pitch in front of people that I knew. So then I thought that it was normal to pitch cold to the investor. Well, no, that's dumb. 
It's not dumb. It's, I mean, it's not, I mean, and sometimes you don't have a choice, right. But I think yeah. with you in particular, I mean, Patty, I remember having conversations where you were, were telling me about some feedback you received, right. Because you weren't a doctor or you weren't an expert in X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And what we talked about is that only you can bring this invention and this process and this amazing solution to the world because of your whole life, because of your whole Mm -hmm. being. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, you know, I'm really honestly not trying to be sexist either way, but I feel like that's a strength that a lot of women bring, whatever their life situation is. Like the environment that we're in and the conversations we have a lot of times are different Mm -hmm. than those of men. And so, you know, I I think there's, there's a different, more compassionate way usually, but also like it, it doesn't mean that you have to apologize. And I think so often we're made to feel like we need to apologize for the lives that we lead, but that's what gives us the great ideas, right? It's the simple stuff. Yep. The everyday things that happen and we get frustrated with it or you're elated with it and you adopt (laughs) the process or the service or the product because you're like, this is making my life so much better. I love it. Yes. I still believe it. I mean, there is a reason that you're bringing this solution to the world and you're the person that I would bet on for it. You have the perfect life and the perfect skill set at work. I'm not, you know, just trying to make it all about your life. Like, and you surround yourself with amazing humans. And I mean, you're the total package. I love people. As I'm bringing the team together, I have a new hire that is coming on board and I'm so excited for her to introduce herself to the team because she can bring so much. And then I'm like, but wait, I love all of them too. It's going to be so great because I've known her for years and uh, I'm very, I'm very excited about curating of the team. So In the healthcare realm, it's crazy that you are at Bright Health if Mm -hmm. our healthcare folks that are listening. And can you share with us? Because if you think of what are they on a Series E right now? And they just raised like they just went public. Oh, they did. That's right. Yes. Yes. Okay. They just went public. Their last raise was like 145 million. It was a lot. I mean, yes. And what did you do with them? So when Bright Health was still in the inception phase, um, conception phase, well, whatever, whatever the right word yeah. is there, at the very beginning, <laughs> Bright Health was at the very beginning. The founders knew that they wanted someone in the role of chief marketing officer who had some digital experience, some life experience. They did not want healthcare experience because they wanted someone to come in with a fresh pair of eyes and say, okay, here's how we can improve the health insurance ecosystem Mm -hmm. and, you know, create something that's really compelling, something that's affordable. So that's how I was introduced to them through a mutual friend. And we wound up having great conversations around what health insurance, what health plan could look like. So I really was there for the first year and a half of Bright Health. Mm -hmm. So back before there were any employees is when I started to, you know, I think I left when we were over a hundred employees, 150 in a couple different states. But the idea was to set up the health insurance plan, Bright Health, so that it would be a consumer centric health insurance plan. Imagine that. I know. Imagine that. And it was, uh, it was a really interesting experience. You know, I definitely um, have no interest, bless your heart, to go back into <laughs> healthcare, health insurance. It's really such a complicated world as, as you know, and probably mm-hmm. many listeners know, but you're doing important work. That's why I'm going for the fee for service. We are not getting a reimbursement code. However, I do think that the payer landscape has changed so much in the past five years where I think that benefits are turning to a wellness option. How can we optimize your health? Uh, And how can we help you live a healthier life and your employer and maybe Caribou is doing this at looking at benefits. People don't want like, okay, great. I make another $5,000 a year. I'm going to spend that in Netflix or like get a new car. I'd rather look at something that's going to make my life better. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think what Checkable brings could be a a benefit offering that could be used as a recruitment tool. For sure. Right. Sign us up. 
What'd you say right there? Oh, I just said sign us up. <laughs> oh, sign us up. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> I will, I will gladly do that for you guys. Now, can we um finish with let's talk about what caribou is working on, what your team is working on for because now we're in fall. There's got to be some fun Christmas stuff, like holiday season. Yes. You know, one of the things that really draw me or drew me to caribou was our purpose statement, which is all about creating day-making experiences that spark a chain reaction of good. That's the full expression. And there's so much built in there, right? With day-making, right? I mean, most people come see their baristas first thing in the morning and we get to set them up in the best way possible with the most delightful items. Mm-hmm. Or if, even if you come for a pick me up during the day, it's all, you know, that's, that's what we're really serving is that day making piece. And then the idea of taking that, paying it forward and, and sparking some good stuff. And so as a brand team, we get to do a lot of really fun things with that, right? Everything from the marketing, fun designing cups to, some of the stuff that you can interact with online, uh, the, you know, there, there's so, there's so many great things. There's that side of it. And then there's even the stuff that we do in the community. So we do a lot with activations, especially, you know, now, I mean, our focus has been on um, healthcare workers, specifically serving frontline workers, you know, nurses, et cetera. Mm -hmm. We have a boot truck that we take around and um, make sure that we're, you know, fueling, our frontline workers as much as possible. So we'll be doing some more of that this holiday. Cause again, with a purpose statement of being able to spark chain reactions of good and creating day making experiences, you can understand how fun that is. So we're doing, I mean, we do that all year round, not just holiday, but for some reason holiday does feel magical, doesn't it? It does. You got to spread the cheer. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And we'll have all of our drink favorites back. You heard it here first, but oh, good. Uh, yes. I loved it. I love it because your uh, topping is better than anyone else's. Your whip topping and your chocolate shavings on top. So there's a reason for that, Patty. It's because we only use real ingredients. Now I sound like a commercial, but it is actually one of our compelling points of difference is there's no fake anything in our stuff. It's all real. So we melt real chocolate chips and we use real everything. Do you remember when caribou went from the powder to the chocolate, like the actual chocolate that you're doing now, it was a pretty big deal. And why would we ever go back? Like it was so, it's so decadent and delicious and wholesome. And I feel like, is this only a Midwest thing or do other people do it like this? And are you going to bring, can we talk about the big announcement? What is the big announcement? I don't even know. With Panera. Oh yes, of course we can. We and let me say this. So we actually have been aligned with Panera. They've always been a sister brand, but now we're even, you know, closer united. We made the big announcement that um, we're going forward as Panera brands. So Panera, us and bagel brands, which is really exciting actually, because we're big fans. They're fans of us. We're different, you know, enough, but we have some shared characteristics. So it's been awesome. I love the Panera team. That is so cool that you get to be a part of that. Yeah. But I will say this, that nothing about caribou is changing. We're still independently operating and going to be doing our own thing. So it's not like we're going to be having Panera pastries or they're going to have caribou coffee. It's just more about the camaraderie and, Mm -hmm. you know, what we can do together. Good. That's always good. And behind you, you have your uh, caribou jean jacket. Look at you. Yeah. That is some nice merch. Can, is that only for, does it have your Team members, it has our tag on the front. Life is short. Stay awake for it. I love that tagline. So good. Well, it was really fun to catch up with you, Aaron. So fun. Thank you for having me. Yes, you're so welcome. And if anyone wants to get a hold of Aaron or just find out what she is up to, there is AaronNewkirk.com. And then you can find her on LinkedIn too. So have a great day, Aaron, and thanks so much. Thank you, you too. Thank you for listening to the Persevere Podcast, powered by Checkable Medical. Head over to PerseverePodcast.com for notes, links, and additional resources from today's show. To continue hearing insights and gaining knowledge from those persevering, succeeding, and making their dream a reality, 
Be sure to subscribe through your favorite podcast app. Now go make it happen. 